a few people um, said after I made that, oh, Sumner's getting into Western art. <laughs> Basically, it was just reflecting the Marlboro Man. That's where the image came from. And it's not even, not even saying anything about my feelings about the Marlboro Man, other than he's everywhere. Very, very pervasive image. Another one was a looked like a neurotic uh, female figure that might have been fondling her breast, but in fact it was examining herself for cancer. So a lot of these operate on different levels, two or three. Uh, same thing with uh, one of the wall pieces had uh, four figures on it, two women on each side, and a man in the middle and a little boy. And originally it started out as a uh, not a commission, but a request. A friend of mine up in uh, near Aspen years ago was building a house, and he was going to put a solar collector in the house. Um, and part of the solar collector is something called a zombie wall. Zombie wall is just a big, heavy, massive wall for collecting heat. He uh, initially wanted me to make uh, tiles to put on the wall. But he didn't have the money and I didn't have the time for a real good tile job. So I ended up simply deciding to uh, make some huge templates, which we could embed on the forms of uh, concrete forms. And then when, when we poured the concrete and stripped the forms away, they'd have a bas relief of something. And something turned out to be his family. He had at the time, he had a, a wife and one kid, one wife, <laughs> one kid. So I invited them to come over to the studio, and I took photos of them playing with the kid, stretching them out, turning them upside down, just you know, silliness. And uh, eventually, then transferred those to a projector, just like yesterday, blew them up over life size, and cut them out of. Solitex, something like this stuff up here. And nailed them on the form and it worked fine. Well, let's make a long story short, when it's all finished with it, we still had those images. And at some point he decided, well now it's time to <coughs> compress them instead of enlarge them, turn them back to uh, wall plate size and made stencils. I sense the same imagery of the family. Now you might say it's a family at play, and yet because I included the mother or the woman the second time, she's on one side, and I turned her over the stencil and did it again on the other side. I wasn't even thinking about it at the time. I just thought what needed to be done, that is the space was empty, it needed to be filled up. Now people look at it, and uh, women look at it, and say, oh, that that's wonderful. That reminds me of myself. This is me on one side with my family, and this other woman on the other side represents my career, which I'm also doing at the same time. Uh, but then if they're going through a bad time, you know, that's the other woman. <laughs> and I didn't see that when I made it. They told it to me later on. So it's a matter of... Uh, Discovery on my part, I think, as much as it is on others. others. Well, I said I wasn't going to get the kind of talk very much, so I better stop.
scientific uh, discussions and studies about that, but uh, I'm not scientific enough to explain it. On the other hand, I know from experience that uh, it is possible to get organization and things of control and quality out of the things that seem not to be controllable. When I was running the uh, Scripps College National. It was a, this year it's the 50th year, so I guess it's the oldest one in the country. And uh, it was a real privilege to be able to curate that every year. But I chose not to curate it myself for reasons of trying to find a more interesting program than just one point of view. And I ended up doing something that sounds kind of crazy, but it worked beautifully. If I needed 15 artists in a year for, an, for our exhibit, I would send out 15 letters to uh, 15 other people who were, I was not inviting in the show. I was inviting them to invite somebody. So it would be like uh, collectors, uh, other potters, people who had been in the exhibit before, um, art critics, um, people, anyone who traveled around and saw other uh, artwork or play work being done all over the world. As a result, I'd end up with 15 unknown selections. Uh, you would think that's very chaotic, but in fact, it turned out to be a, a very strong show and in some ways uh, prophetic, actually, even ahead of its time, because um, a lot of the people who were invited were unknown except to the teacher or to the art critic. Anyhow, it was an interesting way to assemble an exhibit. And in a sense, this is what, this is related to it, this way of just making objects at this point with no particular plan. In themselves, I hope they're interesting. And then later, I hope I can find some composition or some design. It reminds me of that. One day, George O'Keefe wanted to uh, ask if she could come visit the studio and won't even get into the whys and wherefores of that, but she uh, wanted to, I gave her a kind of a tour of, of all the students working. One of the students had gone to the beach and collected some seashells and, her, uh, and then she pressed clay into them, so her desk was just loaded with these odds and ends of uh, seashell images pressed in clay. Miss O'Keefe looked at it for a minute and said, well, my dear, what are you going to do with those? And the, the girl uh, started giving a long, 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 heartsy 
discussion about how she was going to make a field painting or something like that. <laughs> and I saw myself keep getting more and more uh, bored. And uh, finally she interrupted and I said, oh yes, I can see that you can make something of value from that if you just put your mind to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, with all these things, sometimes you still have to put your mind to it. Okay, we're ready to make a new one. Clay. What happened to Clay? Not in your way. I can zoom in. Well, I can zoom in easy. We don't have to wait. Thank <laughs> you. 
provocative. And it's on a lot of people's minds. It has to do with uh, how do you feel about the gallery artist situation? Setting prices, commissions, question mark, determining what to make. Um, something else. I think I have a general question. Well, uh, I almost have to go back a little in history to um, talk about this subject. When I first started making pots, when Thomas first started making pots, <laughs> yes, there really wasn't much interest in clay as art. Clay was not considered to be another art medium, even though it was sometimes taught at the university level, and you could get an MFA using clay as your medium. But as soon as you graduated, there was a big difference between those people called potters and those other people called painters and sculptors. Uh, and even today that exists, and so that's part of what's behind this question, I believe. What, how do I feel about being a minority artist, so to speak, or of secondary kind of importance in the art world? Um, in the beginning, the only place we could sell anything of major size, and major was something like a samovar or maybe a lamp base, it wasn't much bigger than that, maybe a large cover jar, would be through an interior decorator, or a lamp base house, or a furniture store. Uh, you never thought about approaching an art gallery, with the exception of Beatrice Wood and Otto, uh, not, Otto Knoxler, yeah. They were, at that time, very seriously pushing their work as fine art. To do that, sometimes they needed to um, put out um, four-color catalog. They needed to do a little hocus-pocus about um, all the, the glazes, because that was a big thing. And so they gave them really exotic names like azure, blue and throwing green and you know, all these exotic names which had its effect in making the work a little more precious. They also trimmed their pots very, very thin and this alone kind of made them unusable. <laughs> and as being unusable then with these other exotic names it must be better, it must be art. And they got commensurate <coughs> with with that, to get the It used to confuse me because uh, I knew that uh, we, even we students could throw better than they could, and we knew that our own glazes were just as good, and yet somehow or other, if we approached the same gallery where they were showing, uh, the gallery would turn up their nose at what we were doing. So anyhow, it, it, I'm only trying to point out the confusion has existed for a long, long time. Now, prior to about 15, 20 years ago, um, if people bought our work, it was for what I call ownership. That is, they, they wanted to own it, they liked it. The thought of it appreciating in value or reselling it never occurred to them. They might give it away as a Christmas present, a wedding present, something like that, birthday present. But the idea that it was going to uh, be a good investment as art uh, just didn't exist. And in a way, that was nice. They really liked it, you know. That's They bought from the heart. They bought from what they saw, what they liked. Then um, a gallery called Gallery A in Chicago, about 20 years ago now, I think, um, decided to take a turn and to start making clay objects as collectibles. And uh, Alice Westfall, who was the director, started with people like Richard DuBois, Pete Golfus, I think, at that time. Um, John Bob Turner, I believe, was one of the early ones. Um, half a dozen people that she selected whose work she thought could be pushed as fine art rather than crap. And everything has changed since then. Uh, not only 
has there been an acceptance from collectors and galleries and museums and historians, incidentally, that clay may be, can be, fine art. Um, <coughs> what's changed is the, the reason for buying something in most cases, not all cases. But when it gets very expensive, uh, people are buying for its potential investment, rather like buy stocks. You kind of take a gamble. And that's why when I was talking about uh, making major work, I said, you know, if, if it's documented, that helps um, authenticate and give credibility. I think this, that uh, it's gotten out of hand in some ways. Um, the good thing is that it's allowed us to um, make fewer pieces every year and still make the same amount of money. We just work harder, but it also allows us to be a little bit more critical, a little more inventive, concern ourselves with the main art stream. The, the downside is that sometimes people are buying without any uh, real appreciation. In other words, uh, here are a few examples. One is a collector just starting out says, well, I have to have a focus, I have to have an artist, and I have to have rights. So they don't really care more than that. They need a token piece from that artist to fill out their collection. Or if they are buying them, uh, they might buy sight unseen. I had this uh, happen to me a number of years ago. I had an exhibit in Houston. And the gallery owner called me the next day and said, hey, good news. There's a collector up in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, who wants to buy three of your pieces. I said, fine. Uh, which ones did he buy? He said, oh, he hasn't seen the show. He just told me how much money he had to spend. And I should pick them up. <laughs> so that's the opposite of what I, where we started. And uh, that's the downside to it. Also, there's now, of course, the politics of who you know and all that kind of stuff to get ahead. Um, young people have a much harder time today than we did, or at least than I did. I was very lucky. Um, I've never had to ask for an exhibit, for example. Just been asked if I would show my work. And early on, I was starting to win prizes, which um, was funny, did I mention this about the show in Miami? Um, well, if you go back and look through Craft Horizon magazines about 30-some years ago, you'll see there was a real ruckus raised at one point because um, a young guy by the name Paul Solder won a first prize in the show down at the Emmy Lowe Gallery, the Miami National, and it carried with it a purchase uh, prize. But the gallery director thought the pot was so poorly designed, badly constructed, and ugly that he refused to show it. <laughs> now, 35 years later, I had my retrospective in the same museum. <laughs> and they, of course, didn't even realize that historical past. But they scurried around, and sure enough, the pot is still in storage. <laughs> <laughs> and they were going to take it out and put it on display. Uh, in those early days, uh, without meaning to create problems, uh, there was always a lot of friction. Um, I have to say, for a while, there was a big friction between the East and the West Coast, because the, with the advent of the new power wheels I spoke of yesterday, and Volkus and all that stuff was going on, Los Angeles County Art Institute, uh, we were winning, the students were winning lots of prizes and we were getting lots of recognition. And it was, uh, I think, simply because the work was different. It was bigger, too. That, mm -hmm. that had something to do with it. Uh, a lot of, and many places still weren't able to do high fire. And there's criticism about this whole thing that the West Coast fires have an advantage. They have bigger kills high temperature kills, reduction kills, powerful electric wheels, blah, blah, blah. And um, they, people seem to point that that was the success. I always felt they missed the point. The point was that the work was changing and therefore just a little more exciting. It wasn't, it didn't look like it had in the past. And that's what jurors were picking up on. 
I almost wrote an article. I've never written an article in, in, in rebuttal um, to any of the criticisms. I don't think it's worth it. But I almost wrote one saying, hey, I think you guys have to go back and look into the museums to understand what quality is about. Because if you look at pre-Columbian pottery, for example, or a Greek wire, made without scientific tools, made without all the power equipment that we have, made without the high fire kills, and yet somehow or other it has, they, their work was so beautiful, it ele it's now elevated to the world of art. So what finally becomes art? I don't know. I wish I knew I'd make it right away. <laughs> I have lots of theories, but um, how do you view your work so that it is, um, goes beyond the, the, uh, the, the normal and um, is perceived to be important? I really don't know how to tell you what to do. I'm still struggling with that myself. I can only say this. I think time and history takes care of a lot of it. You can only do the best you can at this point, and then it gets sifted, filtered through art critics, through you know exhibits, and through what art critics who cannot do it. Yeah, right. But that's true. Um, yesterday, when we went to Peter Hurd or to the Hurd Museum, I thought we were going to go see Peter Hurd's paintings. I didn't know there was another Hurd. But Peter Hurd was a Southwest painter uh, about the same time as uh, that Iowa painter. Uh, Frank Wood. Frank Wood, right. And in their day, <clears throat> they were, well, I'm just talking now off the top of my head a little bit about the problem of art. In those days, they were the darlings of the art world. They were the American chosen. And then, of course, abstract expression and minimalism and all the other isms came in and their work went into the cellar. People forgot about them, didn't think much of it. <clears throat> That's not to say that the work has changed. The work is still, still there. Now, if it continues, if it has the qualities that will make it art, it's my belief it will be, it, well, I know it is being rediscovered right now. <clears throat> some art critics, some art historians, <coughs> I mean, we'll get interested in it again, bring it out, call attention to its qualities, and it will survive. Maybe some of the other isms won't. We don't know. Um, for the young people in the audience who don't really know who I'm talking about, I'll bet you at least have seen, um, if not the original painting called American Gothic, you've seen imitations of it on t-shirts and in ads and all kinds of things. But this was a painting by Grant Wood. And when you look at it today, it has a biting satire a commentary on the conditions of the American scene at the time. Same thing with American, Daughters of the American Revolution, D-A-R, if you remember that one. Uh, it's difficult to look at that and, and pass it off as being um, unimportant. And I think that it, um, given some more time, it's going to be its own. Um, regarding commissions, I never do a commission. I don't know how you feel about commissions. I will do a commission on one condition. Lots of issues. <laughs> uh, the condition is that they uh, let me design the piece and then I'll show them several examples. Um, then they have to pay me for the one they want in full at the beginning before it started. The only reason I say that is because if you allow them to pay you piecemeal, which is the common way, you're going to end up doing, they're going to end up designing your work. They're going to say, oh, it's not quite what we talked about. It's not quite the right color, or it didn't turn out the way I want it. Reminds me of some of the wealthy people up in Aspen who hire an architect and they'll start a monstrous big house and then the wife will come in one morning and say, you know, I really don't think I want that bedroom over there. I want it on the other side. So they come in with the back hose and the jackhammers and they tear it all out, everything they've done, to move it. So commissions are 
for me um, of no interest. Now, I belong to it, not only to the clay organization, I belong to the sculpture, international sculpture organization. And uh, so I attend their meetings, like the Hansika meetings. And um, it's interesting, there is quite a difference, but because sculpture uh, lends itself to commissions so well, so easily, that's one third of their programs. How do you do commissions? Where do you get them? Um, and then people, of course, showing slides of commissions they've done. Because the money is there. Another reason I don't really like <coughs> commissions, and I may sound a little too pure, um, not puritanical, but too, uh, I don't know what the word is. Sterile? No. Um, no way. <laughs> Critical, I suppose. Um, one of the problems I have with commissions is, especially when you have to accommodate and, and make so many compromises for the site, for the architects, for the owners, the, um, it ends up being what I call bank art, which is decorative and um, not terribly profound or enlightening or in any way really it's it's part of the decoration I, I had a wonderful opportunity one time I was in New York City and I heard that Isamu uh, Noguchi was speaking to the architects so I went to hear him now Isamu had done um, collaboration with architects and put his work had been used to sculpture in lots of ways on architecture so I guess the the feeling was that he'd be very supportive of this whole thing, and during the discussion at some point, well, near the end, the question actually was raised, how do you feel about your collaboration and your work being on architecture? And he's the most, <laughs> well, I'll tell you very frankly, any time put, they put my work on their building, it makes the building more important, but it never helps my work. <laughs> Their buildings never help my work. I have a question. So, what would you, what would be your suggestion for young artists going to school, or any artist just going to school and starting out, wanting to get into books? Well, you have choices to make. That's see, everything I've said doesn't mean that's what you have to believe or the way you have to act, but. You have lots of choices. You can make bank art. You can make uh, a living. You can go to fairs. You can do all kinds of things. Um, and you have to make that decision. Now, if you're interested in trying to have your work um, add to history instead of uh, repeat it, if you're interested in having your work be seminal, <clears throat> if you're interested in your work ending up in the, in the library books or whatever, um, I don't know exactly what to tell you other than you've got to make a better mousetrap. And I don't know how that, what that means either. <coughs> but I would recommend that you do a few things that aren't necessarily popular today. And one is to, when you start showing your work, wherever you do get to show it, price it low. Too many times now, uh, <coughs> work comes into galleries priced as by young people new people as high or higher than their, their peers. And I'm not quite sure how they justify that, but it doesn't sell, that's a problem. So it goes in storage. And I, I have lots of graduate students, they have a lot of storage units all over the country. They've had successful shows, but after the show, nothing's sold, so it all goes back in storage. Now, it's not the money that's important in this case, it's the visibility. And I think when I say, Price it to sell, I'm simply saying then, as Volkus once told me, price it to sell will do you more good in somebody's living room than it will in your garage. And if you get enough out there, pretty soon, your name will become attractive, your work will become attractive, and therefore your name will be noticed. And you'll, be started, and you'll start getting um, requests to do workshops. <laughs> or, um, Collectors will want to see your work, or gallery owners may approach you. They're so full of work nowadays that uh, it's unusual for them to approach somebody. But they do look. <coughs> Just uh, two weeks ago, I was in Chicago at the New Art 
forms. And uh, I have a gallery up in um, Oregon. I never met the woman, but she came to the new art forms. So she looked me up and we visited a little bit. And she said her primary reason for coming to new art forms was to try to find a new artist or a few new artists for her gallery. But she said, uh, there's lots and lots of work here, but I haven't found anybody yet. And I, I looked at her and said, well, what are you looking for? And she said, I don't know how to tell you exactly what I'm looking for, but um, I'll know it when I see it. <laughs> um, and then she added, she said, please let me know. Let me know what you think of, that you, whose work you like. And, and that's probably the best way to get into a gallery through reference from someone who knows your work, might be a teacher, or might be another gallery person, might be an art critic. But the reference uh, from another person is of more importance than uh, all the, all the uh, resumes, the slick resumes and so forth they put up. They don't really look at them anyhow. Maybe you have to do like movie stars, figure out some way to get their attention. You know, uh, when you present your uh, yourself or your slides or something, figure out a, a different gimmick because uh, if it's the same thing that everybody else is doing, they're probably not going to be interested in looking at it. <coughs> Other questions? Well, yeah. Um, <coughs> you're talking about pricing, uh, I recall being in Chicago in 1950-51 and Carson Peary Scott was selling Paul Paul Bulkus's Peter Bulkus's uh, bowls, cereal bowls, for fifteen dollars a piece. Yeah. <laughs> well, to talk about pricing, lighten <coughs> up a little. Um, I had a problem with pricing, and I'm telling you, when we got into this field, uh, our heads were sort of screwed around by. Some, uh, an Englishman by the name of uh, Bernard Leach and some Japanese people, uh, particularly one called uh, Yanagi, who was a kind of a philosopher, writer, and organized a group in um, Japan called the Ninge Society, Ninge meaning the folk art. He also wrote a book, quite lovely book, called The Anonymous Potter. Some of you may have read it. If you haven't, uh, it's worthwhile reading, but I'm only referring to it because when we read it, it was almost became a religion of anonymity and humbleness and not uh, being anything more than an anonymous potter. You didn't sign your work. And the whole point was to make work that was affordable to everybody. So price it very, very cheap. I did that for many years. Um, finally, my work started changing so much that it ceased being just functional, it began to become more, you know, sculptural, more painterly, more experimental. And um, so I was, instead of just selling through the land-based houses, I was beginning to be asked to have an exhibit. Well, I was teaching at the University of Colorado, and they said they would like to give me a little exhibit in their museum. The opening date happened to fall on my birthday, which was nice. The only problem was when I went home, uh, well, I spent all afternoon setting up the show, and then I suddenly looked at my watch and said, oh, I'm supposed to be home for my birthday party. So I rushed home, forgot to price anything. <laughs> Worse than that, my wife and my friends had <laughs> lots of uh, celebration. <laughs> and I didn't even get around to my own opening until about 8.30 that night. It opened at closer to like 7. And of course I was on cloud 7, drunk out of my head. And I walked in the room, and, and everybody was just milling around, wanting to buy some work, but there were no prices. And in that state, in that condition, I just said, oh, everything's 50 cents an inch. Help yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what do you mean 50 cents an inch? I said, well, get a ruler and measure the biggest inch. It's 50 cents an inch. Well, they were pleased. And it was also like Macy's opening the door. It was like, kind of a... Oh boy, an orgy of buying. Blood was really gone. Well, it worked. And I thought, hey, that's kind of a nice.
my scheming. Mm -hmm. Everybody likes it, and I sold everything. Now I can go on to the next show. So the next one, I made it a dollar an inch, or raised it 50 cents. And th that was successful. Now, if I raised it to five dollars an inch, and only 50% of the work sold, I'd freeze it at five dollars. I wouldn't go any higher, you know, because obviously I reached the barrier. Is that the current price? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now, I resisted raising prices, and I was criticized by a lot of my peers who were underselling for being too cheap. But it was only at some point when I employed my daughter to be my agent. She was out of a job, and I needed a little organization, and who better than your daughter? And she's very good at it. She said, Pop, you got to raise your prices. And he said, well, you know, I hate the price work, so I'm going to leave it up to you and my wife, to Jenny. So those two quickly elevated my parents. Well, they needed a raise. <laughs> and uh, they still argue with me about that a lot. They're the ones that kind of think that I'm underpriced. But I do want to tell you one of the problems of underpricing. Um, Michael Cardew, who was a student, I guess, of Leach. Um, what happened, boys? We're just drawing it out. Oh, turn it upside down and let the bottom to dry, not the edge. In fact, uh, hold it a minute. We're drawing the inside. No, no, the inside oh, oh, okay, inside first. Yeah. But keep the outside, wrap the outside uh, edge with plastic. This is thin stuff. Where was I? Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, Cardu. Cardu also believed in pricing his work, making it very affordable, making good functional work and beautiful work, I would say. So much so that galleries began to ask to show his work, not just stores. There's a big difference between a store and a gallery. Shortly before his death, he had a show at the American Hand in Washington, D.C. And I can, I feel comfortable telling the story now because the owners are now dead. But, um, they invited him to have a major show, and the most expensive plate, about this big, in the show was priced at $150, which was set by Cardew, according to his philosophy. When the show opened, nothing was for sale, all red dots. The gallery had bought everything at wholesale, meaning that $150 pot was purchased at 75 and then they could resell it the next day for 10 times that because of his reputation. You know, I guess I'll have to say our friend, uh, but our friend uh, up in Minnesota is going to have the same problem. Mackenzie's going to have the same problem. He's, he, he sells his work very, very cheaply from a philosophical point of view. Now there's a book out on him. He's a famous teacher, workshopper, uh, Probably, you guys want to invest in something, go buy him while he's cheap. If you can get him. If you can get him. Well, you can get him. He, he works hard. But he has shows in Scottsdale, and they're sold out. I mean, sure. You can't buy it. So, that's... My friend, uh, Fer Fergie. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> they're still there. Are they? Uh, well, that's part of what I'm talking about. So, there are other things I'm sure that are important, but... You know, um, I, I think it's time to get some new coffee <coughs> for everybody. And then I'll just come back and I'll have some other. <laughs> <laughs>
people sometimes ask me, do you ever make, uh, don't you ever make uh, hand-built stuff? <laughs> uh, I don't know when I'm doing hand-built, when I'm throwing, when I'm sculpting, or whatever. It's all one and the same as far as I can separate. What kind of building? Feet building and foot building. Well, we do have a bunch of questions, and I do have some other ideas, things I'd like to discuss with you. Maybe I'll start with the questions first. Is it 11:30? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, first one. No, before. Did you write that down, or is this? No. Okay. We'll pick up where. I left off. He had asked a question about, oh, uh, getting started in a gallery and the problem of realizing that 60% might go to the gallery and 40% goes to you because it's on commission instead of direct sales. And I just tell you very honestly, we had a seminar when I was teaching every once a week. We had a seminar, different subjects, usually related to the clay world one way or another, the art world, but not necessarily uh, techniques and so forth. And one night we had called Horrors of Galleries. And the, the, it's so bad, um, I don't even know how to advise you. Um, not only is it unfair, like at 60, 40, but if you're just starting out, they probably want you to pay for the announcements, the champagne, everything else as well. I one time said at a dinner party discussing this problem, I said, you know, I hope there are no any gallery owners in, in the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to be careful because I said, you know, gallery owners are like pimps. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, you know, it's like they see me, will say me say I'm a good looking whore out on the street making my own money and they say, oh, I want a piece of that action. And that's exactly the problem. If you're really good, they want a piece of the action. If you aren't, they're going to drop you. But what's worse is um, what to do about it. <laughs> There's nothing you can do about it. <clears throat> it's part of our system. I don't know of any other business, really, where the, the owner business doesn't have to uh, buy inventory. It's all on consignment. All they pay for is the lights and the help. You, you're subsidizing that gallery, so it's a it's a toughie. I don't quite know how to do it. <laughs> yeah, you can set up a cooperative. <clears throat> Matter of fact, you can... We did that as a student. I don't know if I... Uh, I'm writing, I'm trying to write a book. Some of the chapters are just stories, kind of like in the But one of them was when I was a student at the Los Angeles County Art Institute, you know, when <clears throat> the director hired Peter Bocas to come teach at that school. Peter Bocas at that point was doing really beautiful, high fire, functional, utilitarian stoneware. Within six months, and then all all changed after he started teaching. He didn't have to sell it anymore. He had a salary. He was also involved in an art school. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, his work changed. Not only did his work change, but the student's work began to get changed also. Started getting ugly, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so much so, in fact, that the director of the school, when we had our spring exhibit, refused to show our work. work what's worse, he got up, called us all together, and auditorium and made a speech about, come on you guys, get out of your ivory tower, come down to earth. What he wanted was for us to become artisans. Now he did a lot of malls and uh, architectural designs and stuff, and he liked to use sculpture on it and tiles and you know that kind of stuff. So he hoped he, he, he was training a whole school of um, artisans that would uh, execute his designs. And when we didn't do it, he got really angry, you know. So he said, come out of your ivory tower, <clears throat> come down to earth. That 
Our response was to go out on Sunset Boulevard, <laughs> rent a storefront. I built tin can lights, you know, like gallon cans, spotlights. We put sawdust on the floor because it was a grungy old floor. And uh, 12 of us paid the rent. We paid one month a year. And in that one month, we had our own show. Mm -hmm. so it was our responsibility to put out the show, make the announcements, to have whatever kind of opening you want, and to man it during the, the month. It turned out that we got better reviews on our work from the Los Angeles County Argent Critic than the school was getting. So the ivory tower was the name of the gallery. <laughs> Sure. Of course. Could we ask? It's also more competition. Could we hear the question? Wanted to know if uh, if this wasn't a, as good a time now <coughs> as ever for young people starting out if they wanted to devote their, their lives to making clay. Yes, of course. And as I've tried to indicate, there's so many levels on which you can get off and, and be be content. That's something you have to discover yourself. It does remind me of. Uh, Maslow's uh, philosophy or hierarchy of uh, self-actualization. Some of you are nodding your head and you know what I'm talking about. It's an interesting theory, a little touchy perhaps for some people, but it says that not all humans have the same drive or needs. All of us have some that are common. Eating is one of them. One thing we all share, uh, shelter, love, <coughs> sex. These are all, almost every person in the, in the world has to have those basic needs fulfilled in order to be happy and content. Some people are not content unless they can turn on the tube and watch a Sunday football game. And others are not content to watch it. They need to play it, you see. And then there's others who, that doesn't satisfy their, their needs. They have to go out and uh, create something, to make something with their hands. And you end up, of course, with potters, <laughs> artists, poets, musicians, at the one end of the extreme. They're never quite satisfied with just eating, just having fun or whatever. None of those things. That, so, in a way, I think uh, one can find your own niche, is what I'm trying to say, your own level. In the clay world, in much the same way, you, but you do have to be content and happy with what your choice is or what you're doing. But it can be anything from, all right, I like to, play, I like to even compare it to playing the <coughs> piano. It's available to all of us, isn't it? All you have to do is go buy a piano and take lessons. Now, why do we want to play the piano? And on, I think there are lots of reasons, and they're all valid. It might be just for your own <coughs> therapy, for your own entertainment, just to sing along with yourself. Or it might be to uh, play Sunday morning in the uh, <coughs> church. Or it might be to instruct others. But there are some people who are going to rise to Carnegie Hall and their performance is going to be so special that, um, you know, we pay lots of money, we applaud, and we, we get rave reviews. Well, art is the same way. Um, you might be content to do it just for yourself. And nothing wrong with that. You might be content to teach others. You might be content to make pots for sale, to go to fairs or to peddle from your own gallery. Or you know, there are lots and lots of reasons. And I think that's the big problem is to decide where you want to be. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, this is probably time to talk about this one. 
Uh, can you please talk about rock glazing? I'm sick and tired of crackle white and copper. What can I explore uh, that has metallic or that will be something metallic? Unglowed slips and so forth. Yeah, uh, and low fire salt. Please talk about that. Go to the go behind to give more depth of rock All right. <laughs> Let me say, I guess, first of all, uh, I think this person is on the right track, recognizing that there are other things to do than just um, what has become known as Western style Raku, which is luster, crackle glazes, smoke, and so forth. I, too, reached that point a few years ago. And, uh, I wouldn't say I'm just tired of it, but I felt that I explored as much as I could and I wanted to do something else. Knowing, not knowing what to do next um, is, is a real predicament. But um, at some point, I woke up and said to myself, well, do you remember two accidents that happened in your number of years ago in your career? Uh, one had to do with the time you built a two-chambered firing kill. The front chamber was supposed to be a contan glaze, salt glaze kill, and then the waste heat going out of that was going into the second chamber, acting like a big chimney, and in there we hoped to bisque our wear, the greenware, on the waste heat. The total concept. The only problem was the salt vapor changed the color of the bisque. It turned orange, and if they touched another pot, there was a blush or something. Anyhow, I denied it immediately. I said, oh, this is a mistake. Don't do that. Second time it happened, <clears throat> I forgot the first time, <clears throat> but I needed to, uh, I needed to bisque some work, and then the only kill available at the time uh, Students could sign up for the kills, and they had as much priority as I did, but they were always faster on the sign-up. So I was usually the last one to get a kill. And the only kill that was available was a kill that we normally use for high-temperature salt glazing, but because I was just going to bisque, and because, you know, the book always says there's no, no glazing and no, no effect of the salt at low temperature, I decided, well, I'll just bisque in this old salt kill, and... and be no problem. However, uh, same thing happened. All the pots turned orange. It didn't look like this. You know, this is kind of a nude looking color, just ordinary. But in my struggle to find some other direction to go than Raku, that light bulb went off. And what had been denied as a mistake, I suddenly said, oh, maybe orange can be beautiful. It was just simple. But it was a complete turnaround from rejection to a more positive exploration. So from then on, I started doing what I now call low fire salt fuming. Other people may have other words for it, like uh, salt bisking, because the temperature is exactly the same as bisking. But <clears throat> the uh, technique for that has, um, is somewhat similar to Raku in that it's not controllable. There's a, a lot of accidental involved. So now let me just tell you a little bit from my experience what, if you're interested in trying it, what, you, what I can tell you. Um, none of which are hard rules. First of all, the kill is important. And uh, more importantly is how the flames get into the kill. If it's an updraft with the burners coming up underneath the floor, I don't think you're going to have much success. What is necessary, I think, is a kill with a side burner someplace coming in at the side. Because it's important at that low, low temperature to put the salt directly in the flame. If you put it elsewhere in the kill, it will not, it will still be there when you open up the kill. It's not hot enough. It's not like cone 10 salt glazing. So don't bother to throw the salt into the kill expecting it to vaporize. 
wherever a, a kernel of salt lands on a piece, it will leave a hickey. And you have to say to yourself, I love hickeys. <laughs> Otherwise, it's, it's a problem. But um, it, it won't affect the rest of the pots. To affect the rest of the pots, you have to put the salt directly into the flame. Now, some kills have the burner slightly higher than the subfloor. So if you put the salt in there, it's going to drop below the burner. And it's not going to do anything either. In that case, you have to brick up, build up underneath so that there's a pad that the salt will lay in. And that, if you do that, uh, you will start getting some vaporization from the salt immediately as soon as you turn the kill on. I always put salt a couple handfuls right there before you light the burners. I do it while I'm stacking the kill. So you can think about that. The salt is going to be introduced into the flame right at the beginning. And as soon as you turn the burners on, you'll hear a little snap, crack on, pop, and then the salt heating up and beginning to vaporize. And it will continue through the fire. Now, how much salt do you use? Uh, it depends on the kill, it depends on lots of factors, but the rule of thumb would be to put like a good handful in the beginning, then I would add some more about, um, as it turns to whole red heat, so that's around a thousand degrees. And then if you're going to go, I usually fire about cone 010, uh, so around cone uh, <coughs> 012, I would probably add some more salt. Uh, but you can always salt, you know, just like everything else we've been talking about. More is not necessarily better. If you oversalt, colors seem to get more muted, more dull. So um, experiment. That's the bottom line. Do you use a coarse salt? Yeah, use a coarse salt, a cheap salt. Um, road salt is probably the best salt that's used for mounting the road. But you can use kosher or you can use a ice cream salt or pickling salt. Uh, the fine salt will not work too well because it uh, tends to just burn a hole in, <coughs> into the clay and it will give you problems down the road. Also avoid a lot of salt directly on the pieces because uh, it impregnates the clay and if you get really humid weather, you know, it's going to get that much down here, but in Florida if you get really humid weather, the salt will ever best to the surface and it also eat the clay and it will, you'll have the person who bought it complaining about it. And another reason why to protect it with that acrylic wax, try to seal off the humidity from getting into any salt like that. Now, what about the form of the clay that you work with? You can use almost any clay. Um, my, the formula I'm using right now is uh, probably not the one I'm going to continue with, but it's uh, equal parts of fire clay, ball clay, china clay, sand. That's it. So it's 25% of each of those. And it works anywhere from Raku temperature up to cone 10. There is no flux in it, as you just noticed. Therefore, at cone 10, it might be a little dry, and it might be better if you're going to try to use it at cone 10 to add about 10-15% flux, like Felsvar. But you don't need to. Uh, when you biscuit, you know, biscuit is not very hard. So at cone 010, you'd say, oh, this piece is really soft. Turns out it's harder than you think. And I believe it's because the salt has fused silica, even at a low temperature, so that the pot has a, almost a ring to it. It's much harder than just a piece. One of the real secrets of getting lots of effects is to go, is to fire the kill just the opposite of the way and stack the kill just the opposite of the way that you're used to. You're used to making sure that things don't touch. Well, in this case, make sure they touch each other. Go farther than that. Uh, put pieces on top of each other, uh, add shards, any kind of an old broken pot or a brick, even stones, anything that you can put on the, the surface will act like a resist and, and where it's resisting the salt, that will be a lighter area. 
Somebody with one of my catalogs and stand up, please, or bring it to the front. When you say business, do you mean you do a single filing? You can, either way. Doesn't matter. And what do you bring the business to? Chrono 10. And then the firing the Chrono 10. It's all the same. Uh, I wanted to show the effect of the resist and also uh, the effect of this. So, any, now this is Teresa Gelato on this piece. And any of the, uh, all of the orange is the effect of the salt on the Teresa Gelato. This, yeah, no, the salt's not on it, the vapor is. <coughs> yeah, you see the little hickey here? That's a piece of salt. And here's another piece of salt. See that big white area? That was protected with a kill shelf. This, wherever it's white, that was a protected area. Uh, another easy way to protect an area is to take this clay and make a very, very thin crack. A tortilla. You know what I mean? Very, very thin. Lay that on the pot because that's going to be a total resist from the salt. If you want to put a few grains of salt on there, that will even make it more obvious to be white with that little or if, you, or if you want a black spot, put some magazines. So, uh, you know, glossy magazines like Cosmo and uh, Playgirl and some of those. <laughs> They're a lot better than newspapers. Newspapers don't have enough clay in them. They burn up and they don't leave any carbon. So use a glossy magazine. All your old National Geographic and stuff like that. All the advertising. Put quite a few sheets down and then cover it with that tortilla and you will get a local reduction. That's your little tin can. No, I don't think it will go away. Uh, I have never tried high firing, but I have done this. <clears throat> when I was sort of <clears throat> still doing Raku, I was doing this low fire with my left hand while my right hand was still doing Raku. So I would first bisque the work with the salt to get all these flashes and so forth. Then I would put a clear glaze over the Raku glaze and refire it and smoke it. And all those orange flashes were underneath the glaze and very, very subtle, which incidentally is closer to the Japanese red Raku. When, we'll come back to that in a few minutes, but that's one of the ways they, one of the things they try to do. Have I confused you? Uh, do this also while you're stacking your kill. Get a mental image of a river. Now, not for the romantic idea of the river, but for the, the way the rocks uh, tumble and get wedged up against each other, and then how the river finds its way in and around and through the rocks. Over periods of times, it's going to erode the rock, it's even going to shape it, it's going to sculpt it, and definitely going to change colors uh, next time you're in the river, look at it. So when you put your pieces in the kiln, a little salt kiln, you think that these are the rocks, so have them touching each other and tumbling all over. And then think of the flame like being the, the river, so you want it to come in and around and through. Um, I'm just thinking because, in a way, what I've just said flies in the face of what you've been trying to do. But that's okay, although it's not easy. And it brings up my own sort of interest in, in asymmetry and accidents and the imperfect. And where and where did that come from? And how did I ever make that transition? Because when I first started in this field, we used to think craftsmanship <clears throat> was the ability to make something by hand that looked like it was made by a machine. <clears throat> and if, if pots were not fired evenly, if the kiln the top was hotter and the bottom was colder, or <coughs> one side was reduced and one side was oxidized, that was a no-no. Or if the glaze crazed, that was a no-no. So, you know what? grew up with that kind of a concept of beauty. I 
then moved to California and became involved with Pete Bogus and the Japanese philosophy. We used to go down to Japanese town and look at their pots. It was it was a, a real problem for me, I think, in the beginning, at least a shocking um, discovery that everything I held had held up to be beautiful was suddenly ugly. And everything that I'd always been thought of as being ugly was suddenly beautiful. So instead of a craze, they call it a crackle. And got a lot of money for it, see. And if the piece was imperfect, that is a beautiful crack on one side, the Japanese loved it. Now, I don't know exactly where this aesthetic comes from, the whole difference between East and West, but believe me, there is a big difference between the East and West. I actually feel <clears throat> that it's a religious um, aesthetic that separates us. We have our Judeo-Christian, Greek, Roman, Western ideas of beauty, which have a lot to do with trying to be perfect. And in the, to achieve perfection, we even love symmetry. So there are buildings like the White House in particular, I mean, the, any courthouse, and many homes, especially in the, in the East, not so much in the West are laid out at the front door in the middle, two windows on both sides. Inside there'll be a fireplace in the middle and there'll be a couch in the middle of that with two end tables. When we set our dinner table, we set six or eight and our dinner sets come that way in even numbers. <clears throat> when you begin to get involved with the Japanese philosophy, it's just the opposite. Sets are odd numbers, one, five, nine, so forth. Um, imbalance or asymmetrical balance in their homes becomes far more important. Well, to make a long story short, I finally made the transition, but it was kind of like becoming a, a Republican after I've been a Democrat. <laughs> uh, very difficult to let go of what you once believed. And I think, in fact, this is what the generation gap is all about, just to philosophize a little bit. We spent our first 18 years or more learning what to believe in, whether it be religion or politics or art. And then we spend the rest of our life protecting that. We don't like it if it changes. And it's very true. You've all experienced this with music, with popular music. You don't know who you grew up with, but if it was, uh, if you grew up with Glenn Miller like I did, then when uh, the Beatles came around, I had to make an adjustment. And then when Rock and roll came around, I had to make an adjustment. Because Ben Miller still sounds good to me because I'm programmed that way. And we get programmed aesthetically very early because it's difficult to change. It's difficult to accept accidents. It's difficult to accept imperfection. But now I want to straighten out something because all this talk about imperfection, accidents, and so forth can be taken to mean that I have no that anything goes, and that there is very little uh, control, but that's not true. Um, I'm going to talk now about symmetry and asymmetry, because it's focal and pivotal to what I'm doing. If, we, if you think of a teeter-totter with two kids on each end, pivot in the middle, that's a perfect example of Western symmetrical balance. That's just what I've been talking about. That's assuming the kids are the same size and that they're both sitting the same distance apart. Then the board will be perfectly balanced. Now what happens if you move the pivot right or left? Well, all of a sudden one of the kids goes up in the air and the other goes down. And you might say at that point it's out of balance. <coughs> However, they're smart enough to know that um, if one of them slides forward and the other scoots backwards, or if they go get somebody else to jump on the, on the light end, uh, they can bring that tear tire back to balance again, even though the pivot's been moved. That's where I'm at. That's what I've been trying to do here all through this, trying to move that pivot off-center 
and then struggle to find the balance to bring it back again. Um, thoughts keep flying through my head. I'm not sure which ones to grab. Um, See, one of the problems of, of trying to explain this has to, a lot to do with um, misunderstanding. And I remember when I started to talk, try to refer to Raku sometimes as being a happy accident. Anytime uh, a pot collapsed on a wheel, people say, hey, it's great, it's Raku. It's a happy accident. <laughs> or they go farther than that and push it off the side of the table, you know, and drop it on the floor and say, hey, it must be great, it's Raku. I missed that totally. I mean, that was not my intention. Let me make one more example of symmetry uh, in design. Most of you know the work of um, Piet Mondrian. Um, and he was uh, Western, but he was really interested in Eastern um, aesthetics. And he reduced his paintings to very few lines and colors almost an early <clears throat> minimalist. Now consider this. If he started with a square canvas, the first line that he put on that dictated whether it was going to be asymmetrical or symmetrical composition. So if it went down the middle, everything else then that has a central pivot is going to be arranged according to that. If, but he didn't. He always put the first line off-center, either right or left, and then all the other squares that made up the composition related to that, even the color, he could bring the whole thing back into balance so that you know, a, an intense bright red would never fill the whole canvas. It would be in one of the smaller squares. And maybe a lighter color like white or yellow would take up the, the larger areas because there is weight in all of that. So, that's one of the things I wanted to think about and talk about. And I hope it explains a little bit the transition to ugly pots. <laughs> <laughs> Something else, uh, somebody else has a question, and maybe it's related to this about Raku. Okay. I want to find the one. That Red. Maybe it was another one. Uh, uh, somebody wanted to have me talk more about the deeper meanings of Raku. I'm glad to because I do have a feeling that we have become rather superficial in our Raku enthusiasm, I guess. And I hope I don't repeat some stuff I said yesterday. Sometimes I forget. But um, let's go back to the word Raku. And you know, what everybody knows what it means. Most of you have that little pamphlet I handed out, so I don't have to give all of that. But in the uh, I guess I'll go ahead with this one. When I started doing, when I started changing from Raku, meaning Western style, smoke Raku, to low fire salt, um, galleries were upset. When I would send them new work, they'd say, we wanted a salt. And what they meant was they wanted a smoke pot. Um, even someone with the sensitivity and perception of an art critic like Garth Clark, um, organized the uh, exhibit someplace back east, and I forget where, in a college museum. And he invited a number of people to, uh, since he was curating it, picked up the people he wanted to show, and I was one of them. Well, it just happened that when he asked me to exhibit, I had, had begun to explore a low fire saw, and I decided to send him my new work instead of the Raku work. So he called me up and he said, we're not very happy with your new work. We were hoping you would send Raku. So I said, well, Garth, uh, he wanted me to, to, rec 
replace it. And I said, I don't want to replace it. You can take it out of the exhibit, but I don't want to replace it. My <coughs> reasons are this. There's a difference between a gallery showing in a gallery and, a, and one showing in a museum. Museums are subsidized. They don't have to pay the rent. A gallery has to pay the rent. They have to pay the help and so forth. They have to make a profit. So when you invited me to send work to this museum, I think of the museum as being an educational vehicle, and this is a place to show my new work. So we had quite a talk about whether this was a good idea or not, but he eventually accepted my hard-nosed position and uh, allowed the work to be shown, even though he didn't really like it, and even though, you know, the public found problems with it. He surprised me. <clears throat> Two years later, he wrote a book I think something like 12 American Potters or something. And on the cover was one of those pots. <laughs> it taken two years to come around to see where I was. But um, you have to stick to your guns. Uh, I think that was the moral of that whole thing. And eventually, um, if it has any value, other people will, will get to it. But there's always a time lag between where an artist is thinking and working um, in a creative sense than where the audience is in a appreciative sense. Best example, Van Gogh. You know, Van Gogh couldn't even sell his paintings. I guess he sold one in his lifetime. Now we know that he's one of the, his work is one of the most uh, valued. But it took us a long time to realize that. And you can look at many, many other artists and realize the same thing. All of which makes me a little hesitant to criticize new work. I've done it before and I was wrong. <laughs> I've done it too many times. It also makes me very hesitant to even criticize student work. In fact, I refuse to do it, refuse to have critiques. Uh, I would tell the students, if you need a critique, um, get a body of work together. Don't, I don't want to look at one or two pieces or one week's work. Get a whole body of work together. And then let's have a little show. We had a little gallery <coughs> offer, kill yard. I said, put a little show up and um, I'll spring some, for some wine and cheese and you can invite your friends and we'll just see what happens. I don't think uh, it was ever a problem because when they got a body of work <coughs> together, they didn't need a critique. They already had thought a lot about it and they were happy with it and they didn't. They were not as insecure as, you, as they had been in the beginning. So building that security and self-sufficiency was part of my leaving them alone. Yeah? Do you ever believe there is such a thing as a valid critique by somebody of another person's work? I mean, if he asked for uh, you to look at his work and say, I like this and I don't like that, did you read the article um, I wrote a few years about a year ago called What Difference Will It Make or Should It Make? Somebody jumped on it, Jack Troy, I think, jumped on it, thought it was clear off my rocker, said it was uh, the dying uh, swan song or something of retirement. <laughs> um, I don't think it should make any difference. Now, it will. That's the problem. It makes a big difference because you want to please. Even a, 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 a non-biased critique, which there are, uh, nevertheless, it's going to affect in one way or another. That's not to say I don't believe there is some value in it. The individual has to know that themselves. Um, in that article, I pointed out that Volkus never critiqued our work. He never said anything about it. But I learned to know how he felt about it just by the way he smoked his cigarettes. Because <laughs> if he took a, a long draw and let it out easy, he liked it. And if it was a short puff, you know, <laughs> displeased with it. Um, he had a clever way of, of, I guess, critiquing me one time. And it worked. Um, I, had, I was unloading the kill, and uh, I had tried to make an imitation Volkus pot with his calligraphy and shape and everything. Well, he did not jump me on that. He just said, 
very gently as I took some of the work out. You know, you don't need to decorate unless you have a reason to. <laughs> so I nosedived and I wouldn't decorate a pot for about two months. <laughs> and finally I had a reason to. My reason. And from there on I found my own direction now. Not his. He added one other good advice. He said, listen, it's okay to try and decorate. But if you're going to do it, do it on your dogs. You might make them better. Don't do it on your best spot. <laughs> so that was pretty good advice. Um, critiquing is one of the most common pastimes in teaching. And it's my belief. See, I'm old enough I can have all these weird beliefs. <laughs> it's my belief that most teachers critique because they have to earn their salary, on one hand. Um, most teachers do not work in the classroom and do not let the students watch them make their own work. They have studios off campus. So there's a gulf there between the teacher and the student. Plus, the teacher's going to have to give a grade, and that widens the gulf even more. Um, I had the unusual experience of having three of the most important teachers in my life all work directly with me in the classroom. Back in Bluffton, Ohio, Bluffton College, the old Russian professor I mentioned earlier, didn't have a studio at home. He had a studio right there with us. So because he was working all the time, I felt like working. It was contagious. He didn't give us any assignments. He didn't say you have to do this or do that. And yet we worked our buns off because he worked his buns off. Then I moved to Colorado, went on the University of Colorado, and I had a guest instructor by the name of Katie Horseman from University of Edinburgh, Scotland. And because she was a visitor, she didn't have a studio either. She had to work with us. And then when I started working with Volkus, remember he just left Helena, Montana, moved to Los Angeles, and he hadn't set up a studio yet. And it's my personal belief. People keep saying, well, why do you think the Los Angeles County Art Institute was so important, or the people who came out of there moved, became shakers and movers? Why do you think that happened? Because people we can look at, like Henry Takamoto, John Mason, Kenny Price, Jerry Rothman, um, Michael Frinkus, were all there in a period of about two years. And they've all gone out and done something different than Volkus. It didn't happen much after that. And I think the reason it didn't happen much after that was because Volkus got a studio off campus. <coughs> and so there was a golf, and there wasn't the inspiration, there wasn't that motivation that we got from his presence. From all of that, I evolved a, a new, for me, um, theory of education I call osmotic education. Now, you all know that osmosis has to do with a, a liquid um, with a semi-permeable membrane in between. Uh, a thicker liquid on one side of that and a thinner one on the other side will eventually equal each other. So. Applying that to teaching, I, I feel that if the teacher is the denser of the two or the lighter of the two and the student is the opposite, if they work together, eventually you influence each other. And that's what I mean by osmotic teaching. And in that sense, you don't need to critique. You don't need to make assignments. You don't need to do anything. All you need to do is give permission, answer technical questions, talk all about you know, how to I mean, demonstrate the technique and so forth, but you don't have to get involved with the critiquing in a good, bad, negative, positive, or what they should do sense. Period. <laughs> hey. It's 10 after 12. I, I have a question about the uh, South here still. Uh, when you oh, fire that South, uh, what about after? Does it, uh, 
Can I buy other stuff in this period? Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, everybody worries about, uh, you know, we used to say, somebody used to say, started this rumor, kind of like air bubbles blow up. That's why you have to wet your clay. Now we know it's moisture that blows up, not air bubbles. Um, it's sort of the same thing. People used to say, if you saw the kill, you can never use it for anything else. That is so much bullshit. <laughs> I'll tell you why. The same people who say that put glazes on their pots in the salt kill. It doesn't hurt the glaze. It usually makes it better. They put glazes inside for sure to make it more watertight. Sometimes they put them outside for color. It doesn't hurt it. Now, the kill itself will still have some salt after you stop salting it. But it, every time you fire it, it will get drier and drier and drier and funny. You can't tell that it's doing it. Let me add one other little thing to think about over the new hour. The inside of a salt kill gets very juicy from repeated salting because bricks are made of clay and they have silica and the salt attacks that and makes a shiny interior. The best salt kill is the one just before you tear it down. Margaret Wilhelm didn't salt her kills, but she glazed them. I don't know if that's common knowledge, but she glazed every inside of her kill to make it shiny for two reasons. One, it created that juicy atmosphere that allowed her glazes to be juicier. If they were brand new bricks, they sucked some of the by vaporization, some of the quality out of the glaze. And she knew that. The other reason is, is a more interesting one to me. The glaze acts like a mirror, and one of the most important sources of heat when you're firing a kill isn't the hot air, it's the infrared heat. And infrared is a heat of light, like from the sun. So by making mirrors of on the inside of her kill, she bounced the infrared heat back and forth much faster and the kill was more efficient. Oh, I don't know, I'm afraid of it. <laughs> sure, I think you can do it with anything. One of the things I would like to leave you with is this um, idea about creativity and invention, and what's most important. As a teacher, I think the most important thing was to try to create uh, a curiosity. If you can make your students curious, that's wonderful. The second thing, equally important, is to give them the courage to go ahead and try it, not ask for permission, not ask if it's going to work. I, I used to get that over and over. Students would come and say, I don't suppose it would work if I put this glaze on top of that one, would it? How negative can you be? <laughs> My answer always was, try it. And I've said that a few times already to some people who've asked me some ideas. I said, do you think it would be okay? Or what would happen if? Try it. Uh, so those two things, if you can surmount those, ask the question, be curious, and then go ahead and try it without... Pete once said something very important, and I pass it on to you. Every time you fire a kill, you should have some experiment going on. Even if it's just a, the last minute, grab a handful of feldspar and put it on an empty shelf and see what happens. You should try something every time you fire a kill. Something you don't know. Let's eat. Um, Favorite tools, so forth and so on. Well, you've seen me working with some of my favorite tools, like um, that fork. <laughs> um, I say that the advantage of that is that it's four times faster than a <laughs> Another favorite tool there is the um, bamboo cutoff, um, which I grow myself out in LA. It's uh, important, if you want to come up and look at the tools later, that's fine, because uh, it's important that you get the right angle on that bamboo and also uh, the right direction, because it 
you want it sharp to actually cut, not just rub the clay off. Too many cutting tools are too dull, and they rub the clay and it catches and have a lot of problems. So give a good look at it. And by the way, it's a right-handed tool, so if you're left-handed, you have to reverse the angle. Where is that? Is there something? Do uh, plastic rope because it uh, absorbs moisture and doesn't stick as fast. Oh, there's. Okay, see if you can also find that that metal rib. That's something I make myself. Yeah, this this is the bamboo tool I was talking about, and you can see one of the advantages is with that curve in there. It fits your hand really nicely, and if you use that little joint, it's a place to uh, lock onto, which makes it much steadier when you're cutting than, say, a round uh, handle. Kind of simple. Yeah. You can use a. Uh, you can use green. green I usually cut it with a. Uh, Oh, like bandsaw or something like that. And my brushes are uh, handmade. This one actually was made by somebody else for me, but he made it way too big, way too thick. If it's thick, it's very floppy and it's not very sensitive in terms of the kind of calligraphy I like to do. Um, let me just show you what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, this is uh, just water instead of a stain. Normally, I would use iron and copper in water. Deer, but it you know, it gives me a, a fine line. Uh, so you just use a tip and a nice broad line if you use the bottom. And calligraphy is a very personal thing. Um, so so personal, in fact, that uh, for example, with Sochi Hamada's uh, calligraphy, you can spot it. You know, you don't even have to see his signature to tell it's his. And a number of years ago, uh, I had a uh, couple of students who, uh, one was uh, French and he was living with a Japanese woman and the Frenchman said, why don't you uh, uh, study calligraphy, you have a very nice style and so forth. And his Japanese uh, woman said, oh no, you shouldn't, you have your own style and if you start studying you're going to ruin it. So. It takes a lot of time and practice. It doesn't happen easy. One of the biggest problems I see with people is that they they just flop the the uh, stains off without controlling anything. Um, it helps to get a little drum and, <laughs> and to practice a lot. Now the, the darkness isn't to make it too loose. It's to make it just a little less tight, which is different. And then the metal rib, which, uh, what happened to it? Anybody? Come on guys, look for my metal rib. It's here someplace. That's really the, the tool I like best of all, and the one that you can't buy. You noticed yesterday when I had that aneurysm, how important that metal rib was to uh, work it out, because I could go inside with my hands, but I needed something very stiff to work it out. At the same time, it's not as stiff as a, as a wooden uh, rib. Wooden ribs don't bend at all. So I like a little bit of a bend because it, uh, 
maybe for the for the cloud building, it might be destructive or something. Maybe somebody got another souvenir. <laughs> I think I checked the water. Look on the table. But the rib, uh, most ribs that you buy are made of real flimsy uh, metal. They cut your hand, they, they flop out, and, and they only have a, a straight side, and then you have to buy one with a curved side, and you have to buy another. They try to sell you a bunch of ribs because uh, each they don't have universal shapes or curves. I designed this one many years ago and it gives me a straight edge, gives me a point, gives me a very slow curve, medium curve, and a sharp curve, depending on how I need it by moving around. It's kind of like an architect using a French curve to, you know what I mean? Uh, I used to make them out of tin cans but they rust and this one is not a very good metal. Um, stainless steel is perfect but it's very difficult to cut you have to kind of uh, maybe use a, a metal cutting saw and then a grinder, grindstone to uh, finish it all off. But if you're uh, interested, you can come up and copy this. I don't care. I've been thinking about sending one to the Smithsonian to the uh, what do we call it? Bureau of Standards. So if I ever lose it, well, you know, I can get it back. Uh, it's very thin. Uh, pancake turner. Thick. Pancake turner is a good metal to use. Unless, but like I said, if it's a stainless steel one, be careful, it's going to take a lot of You're going to have to get somebody who knows how to cut stainless steel. Okay. Um, I don't know if I've answered all the questions. One of the questions that came up was a very simple one. Uh, where do you get the catalog? from the retrospective. Um, it's the University of Washington Press in uh, Seattle, Washington. I think that address will get it. And if you refer to it, I think as the title is good enough, so near a retrospective. But for the people who have the catalog, and I have one over here someplace, um, there's a Library of Congress num number assigned to it. And that's what your bookstore would need if you're going to ask the bookstore to order. Because they, they order everything by Library of Congress. And it's in about the second or third page. So that number is 0295 97159. Say it again. 0295 97159 2. Now, earlier I wanted, I wanted to talk a little bit about this particular piece because earlier we were talking about uh, can you use the flashing effect on the that you get from the salt will it go away if you refire it I think was the question and I said I didn't know if it would go away or not comb 10 but I, I know it will go away at, uh, or will not go away at low temperature Raku. And in fact, that's a very pleasing alternative. A person who wrote in and asked about alternative ways of using um, or making Raku, that's one way that I would recommend that you pursue. Um, if you get a very flamboyant sort of uh, flashing from the salt, incidentally, this one is on the raw clay only. There's no slips or stains or glazes, just the raw clay. But there's enough iron oxide in the clay for it to really be sensitive. And if you get one like that, uh, it can be finished as this is by itself, or if you want to push it one step further, put, put the old 8020 raku glaze on top of it, bring it up to temperature, melt it, and then handle it just like you would a crazy pot. Uh, take it out, let it crack on and smoke it. But the effect is very nice because that pattern of orange will remain underneath even though it's very subtle. And as I said earlier, that's somewhat like the Japanese way of making red raku. Uh, to make the red raku, they simply paint the, uh, the, this pot with uh, uh, 
ochre, which is an iron slip, and then um, cover it with a clear lead-based glaze fire. And the idea is that the... Uh, oh, I'll take it back. I missed something there. The best, not the best pot, the raw pot is painted with the slip, then it's fired in a charcoal kill, and the charcoal impregnates the slip, leaving the black uh, flashing, and that's what they like. They like that pattern. But then you cover it all over with uh, clear glaze and refire, and hopefully the glaze will melt and trap the that uh, carbon pattern before it evaporates. It's, I think it's a little tricky, I'm not sure. I've seen uh, Mr. Hamada do it, Mr. Uh, Raku, pardon. I've seen him do it, but uh, I wasn't really familiar enough with it at the time to uh, check him out totally. <coughs> this is one of the more difficult questions. Uh, please address the spiritual side of your work, if any. Uh, I hope, I guess I hope there's a spiritual side, but I'm not sure it's meant for me. Um, I like to think sometimes about there, there's, there, there can be a problem, I sense there can be a problem about what might be construed to be the spiritual side that one's working on and therapy. Now, if you think of a Bach and a Bach chorale, uh, when it's played, to me, there's a spiritual side to it that touches me emotionally. But I'm not sure that it did Bach. I, I sometimes think he probably wrote it like, you know, a business. It was go out at 8 in the morning, go to the studio and write music. Perhaps not. But what I'm trying to get at is that uh, spiritual aspects in your work can be those, those two sides. It can be very personal, it can be for your own enlightenment. But my interest would be to try to have it work on the level that other people looking at it are enlightened or uplifted or given some insight into this mystery we call life. Um, not a preacher and I'm not very religious and all that kind of stuff, so that's another reason why it's difficult for me to talk about it. The spiritual side, perhaps the emotional side, is another word <coughs> that um, interests me. And I'm very interested in, in those connections. <coughs>